why don't the customers do like this? And I said to him, why don't you look like Superman? <laughs> because you and I just talked. Yes. My name is Jeppe Hedo, and I'm the author of Nucleon. In this video series, I've invited a number of knowledgeable people and experts to discuss the black box of IT development. Welcome to a candid conversation about the black box of IT. With me today, I have Jim Didmore, probably the most experienced CIO I've had the pleasure of working with. You have a vast career here with uh, leading roles in Ameritrade. Vacovia, that I didn't know existed, was the fourth <laughs> yeah. largest bank of the US. Uh, you've been in uh, JP Morgan Chase. You've been in Barclays with more than 10,000 IT uh, people. Yeah. You've now last COO of Danske Bank with more than 8,000 people in total and more than 4,000 people in IT. Yeah. Um, and uh, you have, I think, four major development locations in Danske Bank. So a warm welcome to you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Happy. Thank you. It's good. Um, you know, I claim in my book, Nucleon, that the CIO job is probably the most demanding job in the C-suite in a modern large corporation. You have all these waves of different projects. Mm -hmm. I think last year at, at Dansk you had more than 200 uh, with different agendas, different business, uni business units that they serve, different budgets, different technologies. Yeah. You also have to brand your organization so that you can attract the right people. You need a lot of HR. You have a lot of legal requirements. You have strong vendors, Microsoft, IBM, that you have to negotiate with. What, what is your first priority when you enter the new chair in an IT organization? First, I would just confirm that I think it's um, stepping into a CIO role uh, today is an enormously complex uh, uh, task. There's a lot of different things that have to be attended to. Uh, but when you're stepping into the first role, uh, er, when you're first stepping into a new role, um, what, what, I'll, what I always give my advice to, um, uh, to my former colleagues who are now becoming CIOs um, is that you have to watch out for the things that can kill you first. So there are, there are plenty of snakes that can kill you. Um, the first one is information security, which of course, um, we've all read about all the breaches that uh, unfortunately occur on a regular basis. Uh, and if you have a, a devastating uh, breach, even in your first six or 12 months, uh, that, that can um, you know, both uh, ruin your reputation as well as, of course, uh, harm your firm uh, tremendously. So information security is the first area to look at. The next area is uh, availability. Um, again, we read about all the uh, major outages uh, on uh, sites or, or systems. Uh, uh, last year, the, the um, airlines, particularly British Airways, uh, uh, suffered a number of ma major outages, again, uh, costing the company real, real revenue. So those are, those are two critical areas. Uh, and then with all of the new regulations that impact every firm, not just uh, financial firms, things like GDPR, uh, where you have to worry about uh, data protection and uh, confidentiality uh, of uh, the data that you store. Um, so there, there's, there's what I would say, these critical things that you have to look at first. Then, of course, you have to actually execute the agenda uh, that's um, uh, going to enable the corporation to win in their market. And uh, at that point, you have to now start to analyze, okay, uh, what are the things that we have to address first? Is it a cost issue? Is it a digitalization issue? Is it our ability to modernize our interfaces so that uh, they're appealing to our customers? And then, you know, kind of sort out your priorities from there. But plenty to do when you first step in. What, what about uh, productivity? I mean, when we look at the company's ability to yeah. respond to the market, right. bring new products to market, software products yeah. to services to the market, uh, when I first met you, you said that you intuitively yeah. knew that there were 30% unharvested energy in your development organization. Right. But at that point in time, you just didn't know where to look, you said. Yeah. Yeah. And then we went in with Nucleon and we assessed 10 teams and within mm -hmm. then mathematically 
extrapolated the numbers and we actually found 33% relatively low hanging fruits yeah. and an agenda to, to tackle those. Right, right. Uh, do you think, what, what is, how can a new C, CIO, I mean, you're very experienced, you've yeah. had, it looks like you had five years in each job, apparently, or something yeah. like that. I mean, what is the chances for, what are the chances for a new CIO to come in and see these things in a big organization? Well, um, well, if they use Nucleon, they'll have better <laughs> chances. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, anyone that's becoming a CIO, so if we, if we take this and we're, and we're uh, going to give them specific advice, um, software is becoming a more important component of every product on the market. Uh, I take the example of cars. You know, if you go back to uh, 1990, uh, there was very little software in cars, okay? Uh, today, there's, um, you know, 20, 40, even 100 million lines of code in a car, which is, you know, enormous increase. You wouldn't think that software is such a big deal uh, for a car, but it is. Your success as an organization, your success of your, uh, of your company, now depends on your ability to produce software. And uh, that's been the biggest uh, difference over the past 30, 40 years. And when you look at a, a set of services like financial services, which is you know, heavily dependent on software, much more of a virtual product than a real product like a car, um, then the, the level of, of um, uh, dependency on software is far greater. So therefore, your success as a firm is dependent on your ability to produce good software. And um, uh, in, in the production of software is really determined by your software factory, your development team. And if that productivity isn't there, then it doesn't matter if you have a thousand guys, if they're not, you know, if they're only able to produce what um, a well-performing unit of uh, 500 are producing or 200 are producing, then, then you're gonna, not gonna be nearly as competitive as um, someone who in your same industry is able to generate the right software at a far more productive and uh, efficient manner. So critically important. Now for a new CIO to come in and be able to, to figure this out, hopefully the CIO is a highly, has been a highly competent engineer. He's a strong leader of people. He understands that in IT, uh, nothing gets done unless it's done as a team. And we all know you know, from sports, uh, situations where, you know, some teams that have lots of star players and very big payrolls, uh, they don't win the trophies. And then you have other, other teams that uh, do amazingly well because they have, they have gelled as a team, they have common goals, they clearly understand their roles and responsibilities, they have the right tools, they have a good coach, so therefore they have the right methods of attack or defense and so on. And uh, they're basically able to outperform what is uh, the industry or the league norm. And that's uh, really, I think, part of the job of a very good IT leader now is uh, to uh, you know, be that coach that can enable the team to far outperform with the right methods and tools. And um, when you come back to uh, Nucleon, um, the, the interesting thing here is that before, uh, I would say that it took a lot of experience and intuition and observation to kind of figure out sort of what were the right things to do. But with Nucleon, you have a much more quantitative set of measures that enable you to assess both individuals and teams and basically uh, then figure out where, where are you in terms of your productivity or efficiency and thus then make the adjustments necessary to improve. The, 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 the fact that we're more right. people to make a success, it's, just, it, it's not just one man. Yeah. That really uh, occupies me quite a bit in my thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the large organizations I work with now, I was just visiting one uh, very, two weeks ago here uh, with 20,000 people. I mean, yeah. it's huge. And what I discover yeah. uh, also in smaller organizations with 500 yeah. people, what you have is a collective of decision makers where no one really can yeah. say yes and 
many can say no. And I understand that that's good out of perhaps a governance or compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. But doesn't it also stop your ability of moving forward, making decisions? I mean, what are your perspectives on that? I, I would say, of course. Uh, of course, that's an issue where, um, a, as you, you lay it out, you know, few can say yes and, and anybody can say no. Uh, and then uh, things don't change and, and so on. And this is, uh, but I, I would also note that every corporation is, is deathly afraid of becoming Kodak. And I bring up Kodak because that was really one of the first casualties of the digital age, that they didn't move fast enough. Uh, and uh, they were overwhelmed in, in the end by, in this case, digital photography that uh, completely destroyed an extremely profitable business that had been in place for 80, 80 years, 80, almost 100 years. So every board and executive suite is afraid of becoming a Kodak and all of the, the rest. I mean, the, the Nordic example would be Nokia. You know, that would be the, uh, mm. the Nordic example. Um, and it's not like corporations aren't working on the right thing. Um, we all talk about how the iPhone came out and, you know, uh, Nokia should have seen it coming. And it was uh, two or three years uh, that the iPhone was out before Nokia actually, you know, um, uh, developed a, an, a um, competitive alternative, but by then it was already too late. And uh, it's not like they weren't working on the right thing. In fact, they were working on, uh, they had uh, three different teams working on operating systems, new operating systems in Nokia to improve the interface of the phone. Uh, but um, and they obviously didn't come up with uh, a compelling idea, and they had too many conflicting and competing ideas internally. And, uh, uh, you know, it's very hard to take what's been successful for many years and has, is your bread and butter and say, we're not going to, uh, we're, 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 uh, we're going, not going to do it that way anymore or use that anymore, and we're going to dramatically change. So. So uh, what I would bring out first is that, um, uh, you know, all, I think all organizations, large organizations are deeply concerned that they're going to get overwhelmed by the rapidly uh, changing events in, in the digital age. That's one. Second is, though, is that when, when you've been extremely successful, which is why they're a large organization usually, then it's even harder to abandon what made you successful. So given those factors, then the question is, okay, well, how do you, how do you uh, ensure success in an organization? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think the first thing is, is that uh, what, I've, what I've been able to achieve in, in my career and where I've seen it successful, if I take someone like a Jamie Dimon who I worked for or a Joe Ricketts, is that they have a core set of principles and an overall agenda that exactly matches the corporate agenda. And usually that includes something along the lines of, we're gonna do what is needed so the customer is happy. And uh, there's no other uh, edict, if you will, that supersedes that, that principle and the focus. And so if you have that type of leadership, and if you as a you know, senior leader or manager, if you also press with the same courage on those principles, you can make a tremendous difference in the organization. And part of it is just by putting in clarity for the team uh, that works for you and for the peer groups. Uh, you know, you cannot have 100 priorities and be working on them. It just, we, as humans, we just don't work that way. Uh, the first time we met was actually because you were joining another C sweet guy in Dan yeah. Dan Danske Bank who visited me as a customer. Right, right. And and you you actually came out here. Yes. And uh, and and joined for a customer call. Yes. And I was like, why is he bringing the IT man? Yeah. <laughs> but that was because it was interesting for you right. to see what the customers needed, right? Exactly. So uh, so that was how we met. Yeah. We previously talked about high-performance teams yeah. and also the inspiration that you got from Kelly Johnson and the SR71 uh, Blackbird project that he led back then right. 
this stealth recon airplane that was miraculously built in yeah. in the 60s. Um, can you elaborate on that? To me, I think it's, uh, again, I would just come back, there are always uh, common threads. So when you look at teams that have just absolutely outperformed, and we were talking about sports, but uh, if we look at uh, something closer, closer to our field, which in this case it was Kelly Johnson who was um, helped uh, basically was the chief designer and really the program lead for the SR-71, which was uh, a remarkable plane that was developed in the 1960s um, uh, with slide rules as opposed to uh, computers. But the real thing was, is, uh, and if you ever watch the documentary, they talk about what were the elements of his team. They had an an overriding goal and purpose and mission, which was to develop a reconnaissance plane that would enable, that could not be shot down, which mm -hmm. had just happened with the U-2 with Gary Powers. And um, uh, that, um, you know, they had to do it on a very rapid schedule. And um, <clears throat> uh, they were all basically together on that goal. So with that in place, then what what Kelly basically enacted was a tough but very fair meritocracy where the best ideas were brought forward because they were operating uh, really on the outer edge of known limits because you know the plane w uh, uh, flew faster than anything before or since by the, uh, for that matter you know uh, Mach 3 up to Mach 4 and at temperatures and uh, conditions and altitudes that uh, no other plane had operated at and that normal uh, aircraft design just would not uh, uh, suffice. And so uh, they really needed the best ideas. They established a, a team that was an idea meritocracy. And then they held everybody, each of themselves, to that very high standard and just basically judged themselves on that outcome. And of course, very successful. And when I look at um, uh, the highest performing teams, um, uh, again, those are very, very um, similar characteristics. You see these traits in, in uh, the other teams, where, of course, you're selecting the best engineers because, as um, you point out in your book, and as, as we know and has been brought out in top grading, you know. Uh, uh, the, your top engineers are, aren't 5% uh, better than the average engineer. They're five times or 10 times better than the average engineer. So first thing you do is you assemble a team with your top engineers, and then you ensure everybody understands the overall goal and outcome, and you take, uh, if you would, this open um, uh, dialogue, mer idea meritocracy approach, and you, uh, you uh, measure relentlessly and uh, and uh, use that in a very uh, rapid cycle of improvement to, uh, uh, to improve performance. And then you get remarkable things done. In the airline industry, we have very few fails. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's very rare that they fall down these planes. That's wonderful. When they do, they really open up the disaster for everyone to analyze yeah. and yeah. share all data. We yeah. don't do that in the IT business so much. Um, Sometimes in the yeah. public sector. Yeah. We know the results because it's public. Right. Not so much in the private sector. Yeah. We just had a big con company in Scandinavia writing off a billion uh, euro. Yes. Uh, and um, nobody really talked much more about that. Yeah. Uh, why don't we share more? I mean, are you, I, I think you're an advocate for sharing more. Yeah, absolutely. Aren't you? I mean, how, how are you thinking about this? Um, you know, look. Um, First, I'll, I'll bring out, uh, uh, we, we did establish the Nordic Financial um, uh, CERT, which is a, a security um, uh, consortium with the other major banks, and we led that with uh, DNB and Nordea, where we could um, basically share all of the information on attacks that were occurring in the security space, and share that not just with the large banks, but with all the smaller banks as well. These are the latest attack vectors. These are the viruses. These are the mule accounts. These are, you know, so that um, as a community, we can respond and operate as a team. So operating as a team is important. What I would say is that, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, again, if you take the engineering mentality, particularly that comes out of, uh, as you note, aerospace and the manufacturing world, you want to do a root cause analysis. This is the whole basis of Six Sigma. 
where you do a root cause analysis and you eliminate the, um, uh, the source of the defect. You use, a, uh, if you would, almost a Kaizen process uh, to, to this continuous improvement. That is absolutely um, required uh, to get to high availability uh, because that's the only way you can really assure quality is you take these manufacturing processes that were developed and really the father of them was Deming, uh, that, the American statistician who really uh, brought that forward into manufacturing and the Japanese were extremely successful. And then in the 80s and 90s, those techniques were brought over into the services industry. And places like IT, which ITIL, which is the IT operations type standards, then leveraged. So what I would say is that f full root cause and uh, continuous improvement are absolutely mandatory to get to uh, first, first quartile availability. And we insist on it. Every time I go into a place, the first thing we do is we're going to be fact-based only. We're going to find out exactly what the, ha what the heck happened, what was the root cause. We're not going to blame anyone. We're just going to use the data to then mm -hmm. get better. Mm -hmm. And so if you walk in with the mentality of we want to use the data to get better, uh, not to, to blame or shame people, but hey, to get better, then, uh, then, then you can get these substantial improvements. The tough thing is, and you mentioned the write-off of, of a billion, is that in, when it's one thing when it's an availability and you have an outage, you can get some very clear root cause. When you have a large program, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, it's much more cloudy. It's much more murky as to, oh, what's the root cause uh, here as to why? Um, and in many cases, there's, you know, four, five, six major factors. And it's, you know, poor sponsorship, uh, uh, wrong goals, or everybody had different goals that was on the program, or the technology was inadequate, uh, the team was inadequate. And <clears throat> we do not have a good track record in the industry. If you look at the track record of um, successes of programs that, you know, are say over, uh, you know, pick a number, $10 million or $50 million, the success rate goes down dramatically the larger the program gets. And when you get to programs that are over $100 million or, uh, you know, in this case, 500 million crowns or a billion crowns, oh my goodness, your chance of success has just dropped to 20%. Mm -hmm. And then your, your ability to succeed, we're back to, you need someone who is going to lead this program that really knows what they're doing and really understands uh, the issues. And um, <clears throat> uh, that, that's hard to find. Um, <clears throat> And you have to have the level of sponsorship to ensure, okay, yeah, we're really uh, ready to embark on this. So, uh, you know, I, ha I, I would absolutely agree. We need to share more. We need to understand more. Uh, and, um, you know, part of this comes back to Nucleon, which is how do you construct, you know, good teams in the first place? And these best practices on good teams, that's, that's part of the sharing. In terms of large programs, though, uh, you know, that's another realm, and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we don't have enough sharing on the success. Of so, IT is ugly, and IT is ugly for many reasons, also because it's so many disciplines right. that we try to embrace, yeah. right? I mean, security and different yeah. tools and platforms and uh, methodologies and architecture and people and, you know, hundreds of disciplines yeah. that you need to spend two, three years to really get under the skin of. Mm -hmm. And much of this is ugly if you're not in love with it. Yeah. You have to love it to not <laughs> yeah. think it's ugly. Yeah. And business people who we serve yeah. in the IT department typically are not too fond of talking about details in the IT. Exactly. And why is that and what, how do you handle that? I mean. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, it's interesting you say it's ugly, I say, and uh, what I tell my leaders is that, look, uh, um, IT, uh, IT software development is like, uh, is like sausage, uh, and, uh, you know, no one would eat sausage if you knew how it was made. <laughs> and uh, this goes to the same for IT. You know, the business units would be appalled if they understood how you actually were, uh, uh, were making it. And, um, and further, you know, you're, you're just going to bore them and you're going to frustrate them. So, uh, you know, you explaining all the details, that's your job to take care of. 
uh, your job is to take the IT capabilities and translate that to the business unit, the business leader, so that they can understand what is at their disposal and what are the factors. I, and, I, and now, that's, so that's what I tell the IT guys. Then I tell the business guys, I say, you know, you, you have to be careful on how you ask the questions. If you would ask an engineer if they can do something, the answer is always yes. But they don't tell you, but it'll take 100 years, but it's not likely to work. But no one's ever built something like this because it's kind of stupid, so why would you want me to do it? They just say yes, and then you're off to the races and, and you have an issue. So really what you need to do is um, make sure that uh, there's a clear understanding of what you want to get built. And so the greater definition that you can do there, uh, the better you'll be. Now, in the end, um, what has really helped this interface is the introduction of agile methodologies and iterative approaches to development. Because, yes, it's tough to define what you want um, in such a way that an engineer who doesn't necessarily fully understand your business or your customer can build it. So therefore, by starting out and doing the initial design and very rapidly, quickly introducing that, getting customer feedback, business feedback, and then making further introductions before you've fully embedded and built so much stuff that you can make the adjustments is what has really um, enabled, uh, you know, improved time to market and even more important, kind of a iterative approach to hit the target rather than try and just hit the target. You know, we'll hit the target in two years and you're you know, not even firing in the right direction, here you can basically iterate to the target and get there, and everybody's a lot happier, and your chance of success has go, goes up dramatically. When I researched for Nucleon, uh, my agenda was basically to create an overview of all the things we knew yeah. and do. Yeah. Find out. Which is a lot. Which a is lot. a lot, and, uh, and mathematically right. calculate it, right, so that we got yeah. a hard number. So when I researched for all of this, I discovered that there's nothing new under the sun. Everybody knows that we should keep the team small. Everybody knows that some people perform better than others and we should pick the mm -hmm. right people and not just any pe anybody, right? Everybody knows that a nice enterprise architecture is better than a bad enterprise architecture. Oh, there's nothing yeah. new under the sun. Yeah. Uh, we discussed this at one point during our or co our cooperation, and you reminded me of a story of your fitness instructor in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. What was that all about, and how does that, uh, how, how can we mirror that into the IT organization? Yeah, so, you know, the interesting thing, um, my, my instructor in the U.S., he was, uh, he was, um, uh, he, he, first, he looked like Superman, but he was a little bit more cut. So he, <laughs> this guy was, uh, was very serious. And he just had, you know, the least amount of empathy of anybody that I have uh, just about ever met, which is perfect for a fitness instructor. So if you come in that day and, oh, my knee hurts, all oh, this and that, stop complaining, get to work. And the point is, is that there's no escaping the hard work that has to get done if you want to be fit. There's just no escaping it. You have to do it. So it comes back to you know, the things that you pointed out and, you know, a proper architecture, talented people, um, you know, teams that uh, are the right size, that have the right tools, uh, you know, all of these things, there's no escaping them. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, the, the, I think the, the uh, outstanding thing of the Nucleon material is that it really lays out for you each of the factors much more quantitatively rather than, well, you know, it's okay if we take the team up to 20 and one manager so we save a little bit of money. It, it'll be okay. Uh, no, it won't. And here's quantitatively yeah. why it won't. So it's almost like it's that weight scale that uh, you have to get on every morning. And it's like, okay, uh, I, I guess what I did really didn't make a difference, right, or it went the other way. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, part of what... Uh, comes from the nucleon is that quantitative aspect that allows you to really kind of assess more effectively rather than talk yourself into something that's just not going to do the right thing for the, for the software factory. So I asked my COO here, okay. uh, why don't you, 
he was like, why don't the customers do like this? And I said to him, why don't you look like Superman? <laughs> because you and I just talked. Yes, exactly. And then he says, because I don't want to. I don't want to sacrifice what it yeah. takes to look like Superman. Yeah. Are there IT departments who just don't want to sacrifice what it takes or uh, well, put in the hard work you know, to be in the top 25 percent? You know, it's uh, yeah. And uh, and look, it's it. That's exactly it. It's hard work. And you know, a, a lot of times I go into organizations. So as you've noted, uh, you know, worked for a number of different shops, and I've gone in when they were underperforming and a substantial competitive liability. And my, my job is to transform the shop and make it a competitive advantage. That's really uh, the job. And one of the things that I would observe is that in many shops, what happens is, again, they've been successful, and so then they plateau. And when they plateau, that means their staff plateaus as well. So, you know, minimal training, they don't know what's the latest best practices, they may not even know the, 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 the you know, the modern technology and how to leverage it. And uh, so there's a substantial amount of stagnation. And uh, then uh, what becomes pervasive in many organizations is what I call the escalator effect, which is you have senior people who all they've done for 10 years is stand around. And, you know, if you stand on an escalator, eventually you go up, right? You go to the next level, and maybe you know the long escalator is long enough, you go even you go even higher. And uh, the first thing I, I try to do in an organization is say there are no more escalators. We're, we're taking them all out. There's only stairs. The only way that you can get to a senior position, and if you're in a senior position, you're going to have to justify it, is you have to get the certifications, you have to do the training, you have to produce the results, and you have to work do the work uh, that, that's necessary to be a professional at that level. And so <clears throat> this, is, this is prevalent, right? So achieving first quartile performance, you know, whether it's a football team or it's a, a software team, you have to work at it. You got to work at it every day. You got to look yourselves in the mirror and say, you know, where did we do well? Where did we not do, do so well? And the best part is, is that um, you know, areas where, you know, where you have widgets and quantitative measures in IT, which is on the infrastructure and the operations side, the system's either up or it's down, okay? It's either working or not. Oh, okay, or maybe it's poor performing, but you can measure that. What's been so hard to measure and, and people have preferred to view themselves as, as artists has been software development. And, um, therefore, you can talk yourselves into that you are doing a great job or doing well. Meanwhile, you know, no one likes the interface. Uh, it, it takes 500 developers instead of 100 developers to maintain the thing, or you have to write off a billion crown because, you know, uh, it, uh, it didn't... You had to scrap the whole system. Right. And um, now, though, with, um, with, uh, with Nucleon, uh, you can get on the scale. You can measure it every week, every month. You can see, you can assess the individuals, you can assess the teams, you can uh, look at things a bit more quantitatively, and you can uh, then make better decisions going forward and commit yourself to that regimen a bit more. But it is hard to become a peak performing IT yeah. development. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, uh, but we need to do that, you say, if we want our business people to win. Yeah, and you know what, the other thing is, is I've been part of many teams that were, you know, strong performers, first quartile, outstanding teams. They're a lot more fun to be on than yeah. the fourth quartile teams. You get stuff done. Your week is in a box. Uh, your, your business partners are happy. Your customers are giving you awards. Yeah. It's outstanding. You know, it, it's, a, it's an amazing place to be. And, um, and sometimes you get to be part of uh, delivering, you know, new products in the industry that make a difference or, uh, you know, uh, push things forward, if you would. But I would come back to Danske Bank. Look, you know, Danske Bank has been very, very successful and they, you know, they have one of the top technology capabilities in the Nordics, if not the top. Uh, and um, they now have the most modern infrastructure, they have the best private cloud and actually multi-cloud environment, they have the best availability, and they have some of the strongest interfaces. They just won uh, the award uh, this, um, uh, this past, earlier this year, for 
uh, best interface, internet interface. Of course, they did mobile pay and they introduced uh, uh, the business um, interface district. So tremendous amount of, of technology. And when I walked in, the interesting thing to me is that they had, they have one of the best core banking systems in Europe because they had done it in an integrated fashion. Now, is it the most modern technology? No, I mean, heck, it, it's in some of the uh, languages that I wrote when I first got out of school. So God, we know it's old, but, uh, but it was But that well, still works. Exactly, it was well architected. Yeah. And I, I come back to, you know, proper architecture. You know, yes, you want to have an outstanding team, but boy, you want to be building the right thing. And the right thing was built. Does it need to be updated? Does it need to be a APIs added into it? Uh, new features and capabilities on the interfaces and move to different stuff? Yeah, of course. But that, that's a, you still have an outstanding core or kernel that you can build off of. So very proud to be part of that team and even prouder that we could take it to a much higher performing one and with the leaders that are there now, I think they'll be able to continue to drive that. Now these days we see some of these uh, IT scandals in the public sector, right, that we talked about. Yeah. And um, it's a disaster for many reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, perhaps you can't uh, claim tax for two, three, four, five years like we had in Denmark. Yeah. Or your house won't be able to be evaluated for right. like, I think now almost 10 years. Yeah, yeah. And we have probably have the same uh, things in the private sector, just not so openly out there. Right. And then, then we fire the CIO and then we hire a new yeah. one and then you yeah. need to give him time. I mean, do you have hope for this? I mean, do you <laughs> have? First, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you, uh, Denmark has had its share of uh, public uh, IT scandals, uh, probably uh, a little bit worse than others. But I will tell you, um, you know, having done some research on this, you know, I, I, I write the blog, uh, one of the worst ones I, I saw was um, was actually in the UK, and they, uh, I have to tell you, t at least two, the other one's Denver Airport, but in the UK, they were trying to consolidate all of the uh, call centers where you, you know, you called in for emergency, and I don't know, they had like uh, 50 of them around the country, and they wanted to consolidate them, I think, to one or two, something like this. And they had spent 500 million pounds, which is, what, five billion, Crown. And um, they had only like consolidated like, I don't know, a handful of the centers. And they basically had to scrap the whole program and just leave it at how it was. So this is just a, an enormous amount of your taxpayer dollars, uh, crowns, etc., going down the hole, right? Just a giant mess. Um, so what's the, the other what's, one? The other one is the Denver airport. And when the Denver airport first opened, they we're going to have this completely automated baggage system that would enable the baggage to go from one terminal to the next, from one flight to the next, and wouldn't need any people and everything like this. And, you know, the Denver airport, I'm trying to think, it was a while ago, it was like, uh, geez, 25 years ago, that uh, almost 30 years ago that they opened. But it was a complete disaster. They had baggage stacked up in hallways and no clue where the bag should be going. Nothing worked. And so But I you still have hope. Yes, I still have hope. Because what you find out is that you go back and there's a great book. It's called Software Runaways. Uh, it, I think it's actually out of print, but it's a great book. There, there are seven factors as to why uh, large programs fail. And uh, it, it's like, uh, you know, before a bridge fails, actually the cracks are there, you know, months, years before. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the program. You can go in and you can inspect the program and you can see whether or not uh, uh, the problems are there. And they're, they're very common, you know, the, the sponsorship, the requirements, the technology. We discussed the big and, program know, in Scandinavia that you and I observed together. Yes. And we identified, you know, I think you said, who's the program manager? We yeah. Could, we cannot identify yeah. the program manager. We cannot find out through our right. uh, network what is the name of the guy right. or the woman. Right. Who's responsible for this big program? Which is a, a clear sign. Which is a clear sign something's not going to succeed. Right. Exactly. Right. Then we had another sign. We looked at uh, staffing up with uh, yeah. six, seven hundred 
uh, consultants yeah. over half a year. Right. Then you, we said, you know, that's not that, that's not possible. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. So so the, that was the cracks that you're talking about. Right, so you yeah. have these cracks you can see right. when you're experienced. Exactly. So th those were the first warning signs, if you would, um, because you know if you don't have a clear abiding purpose and governance, if you would, for the program, it's not going anywhere, and uh, where where it's going, uh, no one no one quite knows, and I can assure you, it's not going to go where you want. And uh, that was clear from the start. And then, of course, we have the mythical man month, uh, uh, which has, uh, you know, uh, always been true, that rule. And uh, here, you know, adding 700 contractors in six months, wow, uh, they're, they're not going to get any work done. Bound to go wrong. Yeah. So we have this huge, huge hugely complex IT area. Yeah. Uh, I have tried to chip in. I'm an old man now. Uh, this is probably one of my last inventions to try and chip in with the Nucleon right. formula to try and look at what you call the organizational yeah. crystal yeah. Uh, on an individual level, on a team yeah. level and on a, compl a complete organizational yeah. level and see if we could easily calculate some indicators on what to right. prioritize. Uh, have you seen any other tools in the marketplace in your career that, that also gives you this view into the crystal? Or are we breaking new ground here? I, I think you're baking, breaking new ground here. I mean, the other thing we, had, we mentioned it earlier is top grading because, again, the yeah. input into the teams, which Nucleon really lays out, is getting the best staff. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and, of course, that's a, an enormous tool and approach. And, Another one I would say is what, what I call pipelining, where you're always out looking for good talent and you're always bringing in junior talent and building it. Because mm -hmm. in the IT industry, it's been a, a full employment industry for 30, 40 years, very few uh, periods in time when it was not. And thus, you must always plan on building your team if you want to have a great team. So you have to have that pipeline of juniors. You have to use a top grading approach, especially for your seniors. Uh, you have a very rigorous approach included in Nucleon. And then once you're there, then the key is uh, really assessing the team and driving the team. The only other thing I would say is you want to also augment it with the architecture you know, and the strategy so that you make sure you're building the right thing. You say now something that we know, everybody knows in the IT business. Good yep. people deliver more. Right. When I look at my big Clients, I have 160 clients in nine countries, so I have a very interesting viewpoint yeah. into yeah. this. Very broad. Very yeah. broad, right? And uh, none of them take recruitment seriously. No, I, know. I mean, none of them. None of them. When you look at the HR functions, yeah. it's much more compliance, regulations. Yeah. What do you have? Administrative. I mean, it is always, I mean, the worst big companies, IT departments, it's even procurement that chooses people when it's the consultants, right? Mm -hmm. And out of CVs only and pr prices as low as possible. I mean, it's just the contrary to finding the right people. Right. And if you look at the project managers where they're allowed to, which is by far the most successful customers yeah. I have, is where the project manager can do it. He or she only hires, I don't know, five, six candidates yeah. a year. They'll never be... Right you right. know, experienced enough to make exactly. the right decisions. Exactly. And none of my customers have core HR teams, really HR, you know, a recruitment yeah. specialists, none of them. I, I understand. I, you know, this is, um, this is one of the things that uh, inevitably I have to teach my IT leadership team. When I go into a new shop, this is inevitably first on the agenda, which is guys, um, you cannot view this as an, I, I, I'd call it an administrative task. They view yeah. it as, oh, okay, all right, yeah, we'll just kind of sort of fill out the performance management. Oh, yeah, uh, the recruiting. Yeah, we'll just kind of get some guys from the university that we always get, or we'll just hire whoever is the first guy that comes in the door that has, you know, the qualifications that's needed. And that's just a gigantic mistake. Um, your costs, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, a poor senior hire can, can cost you three, four, ten times his, uh, his salary because of the, uh, the poor decisions that uh, he will make and the angst that uh, they could potentially cause in the organization. And what I would suggest is that, uh, again, it, it's not obvious that the outcomes are driven by the people. 
which you would think, hold on, the, 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 the guys that are producing the, the output is the software developers, so therefore our attention must be focused on them. But unfortunately, because of the industry and how we've been brought up and, and our knowledge base, uh, we don't focus on that area. You know, I go back, what do engineers value? Engineers value the technology itself and uh, the, the um, knowledge and skill around that, that particular uh, uh, technology that they specialize in. And they probably went into engineering because, you know, in all honesty, uh, the technology was far more interesting than other more people-oriented mm -hmm. uh, uh, fields. And so the last thing they want to do is talk to people. And then they end up, because they were the best engineer, they end up as the manager. And, uh, and now they're supposed to be managing people, and they have never prepared for this in their mm. life. And uh, further, they don't necessarily value those skills. Um, so the, like I said, the first thing I'll do when I go in is say, guys, you, you're, you have to understand your most important work of the day is uh, the, the HR work that you've been putting off as administrative. It's, hiring, recruiting, retaining, developing your staff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be your, if you would, your worst boss because uh, that you, you thought you could get because I'm going to make that the most important thing for you. And um, maybe you've previously been able to put it off or avoid it or you know, just spend a little bit of time on it, but uh, we're now going to spend you know, fully uh, a third of our time on this because it's the most important task. And then the amazing thing is, is that after they spend six, 12 months, they do workforce plans that they've never done. They do performance management they've never done. They actually talk to their staff, which they've you know, tried to avoid for years. And all of a sudden their teams begin performing better. They become better leaders. And uh, then it dawns on them, but initially, I, you know, I have to do it uh, the other way, which is, okay, I'm going to direct you that we're going to be good managers. Jim Didmore, thank you very much for taking the time to prioritize sure. this. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, talking uh, candidly about uh, the black box of IT. Thank you, Yuppie. It's been a good uh, morning. Thank you. Thank you.